Matthew chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can turn there, but it's also up on the screen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hellfire. So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance again to, to be here together like this. And Jesus, I thank you for your honesty in this sermon. There's a lot in this sermon that is difficult, hard, weighty, might rub us the wrong way or might really, really challenge us. Jesus, I thank you that you don't sugarcoat things. You don't tell us things other than the way they are. And your word is truth. Even when it's hard, it's truth. It's good. It's life-giving. So Jesus, help us to hear what you have to say to us today. And may the transformation that needs to happen in our lives happen as a result. Pray these things in your name. Amen. So we've been going through uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the way of Jesus in a secular age. And last week we talked about how Jesus wants for us a deeper righteousness. Jesus doesn't just want for us behavioral change, but he wants a, a righteousness of the heart, a rightness of the heart, a rightness of our desires and our will and our motives. And now this week, Jesus is going to start to get into what that deeper righteousness looks like. You've heard it said, but I say. And he starts with, you've heard that it was said to our ancestors. And by ancestors, he means the Sinai generation that received the law of Moses and every uh, subsequent generation. He says, you've heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. Do not murder. And under the old covenant, murder does not include necessarily all killing, but specifically it's referring to killing that is not legal or sanctioned by the community, nor is it accidental. Thus, killing in a, in a God-ordained war or battle or sanctioned at executions, punishments according to the Mosaic law are not included in the commandment, you shall not kill, neither would self-defense be included in the commandment, you shall not kill. Now we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. Jesus says, you've heard, do not murder, but I say, don't even be angry with your brother or your sister your, your family, and not just your biological family is in view here, but your spiritual family. Jesus is saying, don't even be angry with your fellow believer. Now, Jesus is not precluding the command to not murder. He's not saying, guess what, you can murder, but just don't have hate in your hearts. That's, that's not it. He's not precluding the command to not murder, but he's going deeper with it. He is, in essence, saying... Don't just not commit murder with your hands, but also don't commit murder in your heart. Now, the first question I want to ask is, with do not murder, why is murder wrong? Why is literal murder wrong? I'm sure at times we've all been tempted to see somebody done away with in our lives, maybe. Why, why is it wrong? Almost every society throughout history, be it a, a massive nation state empire or even a small tribal society every society or almost every society that i know of has recognized murder as wrong and the answer to the question why is it wrong might just simply be well none of us want to get murdered 
<laughs> and so we should outlaw murder, right? Let's, let's make it illegal so that I can't do it to other people and they can't do it to me. But for God, it's much, much more than that. James, an early follower of Jesus, indeed a brother of Jesus, says this in chapter 3, verse 9 of his letter, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Jesus, or, sorry, James says something very important in this verse. Indeed, it's a cardinal doctrine of Christianity. He says human beings are made in the image or the likeness of God. Human beings are made in the image or likeness of God. In other words, God has marked humanity, men and women, as having distinctive value in his creation. Human beings are the crown of his creation. We are the beings that are capable of having a personal, intimate, back and forth relationship with God. We are the ones that are capable of reflecting his heart and his character to the world. Human beings share in some of God's attributes, his knowledge and creativity and love and sacrifice and forgiveness and grace and mercy and compassion. Human beings have been gifted uniquely with a delegated authority from God to rule on the earth as representatives of his kingdom. Human beings are made in the image of God. We have distinctive value in the creation. Now the image of God in us has been twisted and distorted as a result of the fall, as a result of our collective and individual rebellion against God. But the image of God has not been annihilated in us. We are all, even as rebels, still made in the image of God. To curse a human being, then, is to curse God. John, another early follower of Jesus, would say that you cannot claim to love God and hate people. If you hate people, you hate God. You can't divorce those things. Jesus himself would say that the second greatest commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves is like the first greatest commandment which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, for Jesus, if you love God, you'll love people. The love of people flows naturally from the love of God. And if you love people, then you love God. They're, they're distinct commandments, but you can't really separate them. They flow into each other. Love God, love people, love people, love God. There is, there is hear me, no separating... There's no separating how we treat people from our view of God. There's no separating how we treat people from our view of God. And so when we talk about why not murder, it's not just taking another human being's life that's wrong. To murder another human being is to try and snuff out the image of God in them. It is to try and murder God, to render God non-existent. Murder, therefore, biblically is, is very, very grievous because it isn't just an attack on the creature, which is bad enough. It is also, by an extension, an attack on the creator as well. It is not just saying to a human being, I wish you didn't exist, but it is also saying to God, I wish you didn't exist. I hate you. I want you dead. I want you gone. Murder is a very significant, significant, grievous sin. And Jesus agrees with it. Don't murder. Don't murder. Now before I get into the second part of what Jesus has to say, just as a brief aside, I have to ask, imagine, or I guess not ask, imagine with me, what would our world look like if we saw every human being as made in the image of God? What would our world look like if we saw every human being as made in the image of God? What if we saw 
that homeless person panhandling on Bank Street or Rideau Street or Dalhousie as made in the image of God? What if we saw the person addicted to drugs or alcohol as made in the image of God? What if we saw the person wrestling with schizophrenia as made in the image of God? What if we saw the, the masses of men, women, and children crammed into filthy refugee camps with nothing but the clothes on their backs as made in the image of God? What if we saw illegal immigrants as made in the image of God? What if we saw every member of the Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, the KKK, any terrorist organization, what if we saw every member of them as being made in the image of God? What if we saw every terrorist and every enemy combatant as made in the image of God? What if we saw the incarcerated as made in the image of God? The sex offender, the drug dealer, the murderer, the mass murderer, the abuser, the, the repeat offender in and out of jail. What if we saw our indigenous neighbors and their children as made in the image of God? What if we had seen them as made in the image of God? Would history not be different? What if we saw not just the exploited but even the exploiters? as made in the image of God, not just the oppressed, but even the oppressors? What if we saw our neighbor as made in the image of God, the neighbor with differing political views, <clears throat> the neighbor with a different religion or no religion, a different ethnicity, a different orientation, a different gender identity, our nasty, inconsiderate, belligerent, difficult <laughs> neighbor, what if we saw every worker in an organization from the executive to the janitor as made in the image of God? What if we saw people with severe cognitive or physical disabilities as made in the image of God? Kids with challenging behavioral issues, seniors with advanced dementia, people with degenerative diseases like ALS, MS, Huntington's, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all of them, it takes a lot of money to care for them and they're not contributing to the economy. What if we saw them as made in the image of God even if they can't contribute in the ways we think everyone should contribute? What if we saw the unborn as made in the image of God? The image of God doesn't come after birth. Jesus, in order to be fully human like us, started as a fertilized egg. What if? What if we saw all these people and more as made in the image of God? Would it change anything about how we treat them? Would it change anything about our systems or our policies or our daily interactions? I believe that it would. Everyone is made in the image of God. That's how we need to see every living, breathing human being. It's interesting, we talk a lot about human rights and justice these days, and I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad about that. I think that's a fantastic conversation, but we sometimes act, not necessarily us in this room, but in the broader culture, we act like this idea came about as a result of the Enlightenment, and it has come to fruition in our post Christendom, secular culture, but human rights is actually a deeply Christian idea that goes beyond or before the Enlightenment, and it's based in the Imago Dei, the idea that everyone is made in the image of God. Darwinian evolution doesn't get us to human rights and justice. The Imago Dei does. The idea that every human being, regardless of their actions or their circumstances or their identity, is marked by God as having distinctive value in his creation. His crown. His crowning achievement. We're made in the image of God. Imagine society if we took that seriously. And so because we're made in the image of God, many things are wrong, but murder is wrong. And Jesus concurs with the law of Moses here. Don't murder, but he goes even deeper with it. He says to have anger with your brother or sister is like 
murder. Now, I don't believe that Jesus is saying here that being angry with someone is as bad as literal murder. (laughs) Well, I already hate them, so I guess if it's the same thing, I might as well go all the way, right? No, no. (laughs) Murder, literal murder is very, very bad. But Jesus is saying here, anger is also sinful and deserving of judgment. It's also sinful and deserving of judgment. What's going on in your thought life and in your heart? And therefore, it is something that Jesus had to die for. It's something that needs to be repented of, turned away from, something that needs to be forgiven. You need grace for it. You need salvation from it. Nor do I think Jesus is saying that we can be angry with non-Christians, right? This would run counter to a lot of Jesus' other teachings. His second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. In his famous parable of the Good Samaritan, the point is that we need to see every person is made in the image of God. We need to love across ethnic and religious and historical, cultural divides, right? So Jesus, Jesus is here primarily teaching his disciples how they should treat each other, but how we treat each other should radiate out to how we treat others. How we treat each other should radiate out to how we treat our neighbors that are not Christians, that don't see the world the same way as we do. Nor is Jesus saying here that all anger is bad. There is a righteous anger, right? Paul, in one of his letters, he says, be angry, but do not sin. Right? There... It's, it's right for us to be angry about the injustices that we see in the world. Jesus got angry from time to time. How long must I put up with this impossible generation? At one point he says, I don't imagine him saying that with a giant smile on his face. How long do I have to put up with you guys? No, he's angry in that moment. He's angry in the temple when he sees people using God for their own financial gain and leading people astray. Jesus was often angered by religious hypocrisy. God gets angry. You read the Old Testament, you read the book of Revelation especially, God gets angry. So there is a righteous Anger, an anger that comes from God, an anger that reflects the heart and the character of God. But as Craig Blomberg says, it is unusual for human anger to be free from mixed motives and not be in some sense self-avenging. There is a righteous anger, but rarely, I would say, and this is from my own experience, Rarely is our, right, our anger wholly righteous. And rarely is our anger towards other people not somehow self-avenging. When we're wronged, we want revenge. We want to return evil for evil. We want to give them back what they gave us and then some. We want to withhold forgiveness and make them suffer emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. We want to enslave them to groveling and penance. We want to turn other people against them. We want to lash out and tear them down. We want to oppress those who oppressed us, enslave those those who enslaved us, exploit those who exploited us, abuse those who abused us, hurt those who hurt us, discriminate against those who discriminated against us. This is unrighteous anger. And I think that that's the anger that's in view here, a a hateful, malicious, spiteful, devaluing, self-avenging anger. And I think that's borne out in, in the verses that follow. Jesus says, whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. Now, some of your translations might have the direct, untranslated Aramaic word, raka, there, which does sound more forceful than fool. Raka! Right? And that's a good one. (laughs) Fool. Eh, Raka. That's intense. I'm not actually calling anybody Raka because that would be going against these verses, but you get my The term Raka is generally assumed to be of Aramaic origin with the root meaning being empty. In other words, to call somebody Raka here is, is to say to your brother, you worthless person, you good for nothing, 
you waste of space and air. It, it is a serious insult that's meant to degrade and dehumanize someone. Your, your life has no value or worth. You are nothing to me. You're a nobody. Your life doesn't matter. You are not deserving of love or dignity or kindness or acknowledgement. It's, it's harsh language. To call someone raka is to dehumanize them. So Jesus says, don't have hateful anger. Don't dehumanize others. He says this, whoever says you moron will be subject to hellfire. Now, moron isn't just you idiot, but it carries with it overtones of, of immorality and godlessness. So if Jesus is indeed speaking of interactions between brothers and sisters in Christ here, then to call someone moron in this context is essentially to call them a, a heretic or a blasphemer unjustifiably, to call someone a moron is to falsely accuse them of serious spiritual error, and it is to deny their brotherhood or sisterhood. You're not in my family. You're not one of us. You're not one of me. You're, you're not my brother. You're not my sister. And, and this can be done for a variety of reasons, right? If, if you call someone a heretic and a blasphemer, it's much easier to dismiss them. I don't have to take you seriously. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to value you. It can also be done to ostracize or isolate or, or marginalize them, right? If you can get other people to see them as a heretic or a blasphemer, then the community will turn on them, and now they're isolated. You're not just turning on them. You're getting other people to turn on them. This is unbelievably important, I think, in our day and age because, my goodness, Christians, we throw around the accusation of heresy so frivolously that we have completely devalued the weightiness of what heresy actually is. And we have unnecessarily divided the church, divided the church universal into 33,000 plus denominations, but also local churches. We have divided our local churches over things that are not of substance or value. So many churches have split over the last 18 months. I have seen good churches split, and it's always over right theology, but not actually. At the end of the day, it's deeply personal, it's egos, it's people bumping up against each other, and then we just got to give it theological, spiritual, religious cover to justify us mistreating each other, taking our balls and going to our corners and, and fighting and dividing. We have unnecessarily divided the family of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And that is no small thing. We are actually, when we do that, working against Jesus. We're working against Jesus and his prayer for his church. Listen to his prayer. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they, Christians, the church, all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be one in us so the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one so the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus wants us to be one. And we seem to be doing everything we can to not be one. And it's oftentimes so petty and frivolous. Jesus says murdering someone is bad. But hating them, dehumanizing them, and falsely accusing them is also really bad. It is murdering their humanity. It is murdering their personhood. It is murdering them in your heart and in the hearts of others and therefore murdering God in whose image they are made in your heart and in the hearts of others. It's destructive, it's sin, it's darkness, it's antichrist. 
There's no point in softening it. It's Antichrist. And it is worthy, Jesus says, of judgment, the Sanhedrin, and hellfire. And Craig Blomberg says this, Some have seen an increasing severity of judgment as Jesus progresses from, terms, from the terms judgment to the Sanhedrin and to the fire of hell or hellfire. But given the close parallelism among the first clauses of each illustration, the entire sentences should probably be taken as largely synonymous. All three metaphorically refer to the danger of eternal judgment. So they're not... It's not a a sliding scale going from less bad to bad. All of these refer to the judgment of God. The judgment refers to God's judgment. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish Supreme Court. Their job was to enforce the Mosaic Law and all of the prescribed punishments for breaking those laws. However, those punishments were seen not as the Sanhedrin's punishments, but as God's punishments. Hellfire probably refers to Gehenna. Gehenna is a reference to the valley south of Jerusalem in which, sadly, children were, were sacrificed in Old Testament times and traditionally associated with a perpetually burning garbage dump in later centuries. Gehenna became kind of a, a metaphor, a symbol, a picture, an image of God's judgment, a perpetually burning garbage dump. So all of these expressions are referring to the same thing. They're referring to God's judgment. All of these, murder, yes, but also hatred, dehumanization, and false accusations, they deserve judgment. God's judgment. Now you might be saying, well, hang on, David. If if Jesus is talking to his followers about how they should treat each other, is Jesus saying that his followers, his family, his people will be judged if they do these things? Well, no. Rather, he is stating what these things deserve, but as his followers, there's grace. There's mercy, there's forgiveness, there's restoration, there is always that. However... I would also say that a habitual, unrepentant, obstinate, recalcitrant persistence in these behaviors may be evidence that you do not possess the Spirit of God and are not a child of God despite what you might have professed at one time. You call yourself a Christian, but you are just full of relentless hate and unforgiveness, and bitterness, and you let go of none of it, and you are unrepentant about it, no matter how much people preach to you, intervene with you, pray with you, you will not give this up, you will not give up your hate and your anger. I feel like you need to have a conversation with God about whether you really have the Spirit of God and are being made anew into the image of Jesus. What's the takeaway from all of this? God values human beings. <laughs> they bear his image. And he especially values his family, his children. Jesus died for them. Therefore, hear me, not just Southeast City Church, but hear me, Capital C Church, not just in the world, but especially in North America. Don't murder each other literally, and don't murder each other in your hearts. Don't hate each other. Don't insult each other, belittle each other, hurt each other, verbally assault and harass each other, lash out at each other, devalue each other, turn on each other, gossip and slander each other, turn others against each other, divide and split unnecessarily. This is not who we're meant to be. This is not who Jesus died for us to be. And, and I, I, I think of what Paul says in Colossians 3, 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Because of how humanity, how we have mistreated each other, the judgment of God is coming on the world. If we've been saved from God's judgment, why would we continue to participate in these things that are bringing God's judgment on the world? This is not who we're supposed to be. Remember, how we treat each other reflects our view of God. 
If we love God, why? Why are we doing these things to each other? Jesus says that by this the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How we love each other shows the world Jesus. If we're not loving each other, who are we showing them? It's not Jesus. Jesus goes on in the last few verses to press the urgency of the need for restoration and reconciliation. And interestingly, he puts the onus here on the offender, on the one who has done the wronging. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. The one who wronged, all right? Either they've been confronted about the wrong that they've done, or they are aware that they have mistreated somebody. They've, they've done wrong by somebody. And so Jesus here emphasizes their responsibility. Now, it, are there responsibilities for those who have been wronged? Yes, there are. We need to confront if it's safe. We need to forgive. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 18, but here he's talking to the offender. And he says in verse 23, if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother is something against you, leave your your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus is saying something incredibly profound here. He is saying relationship trumps ritual. Relationship trumps ritual. If there is something broken between you and another believer, your worship your service, your ministry can wait. Reconciliation is more important. Have that difficult, awkward, inconvenient, uncomfortable conversation. Repent where you need to repent. Turn away from the wrong you've done. Turn towards the person, towards God. Repent where you need to repent. Forgive where you need to forgive. Make amends. Make restitution where you're able to produce fruits in keeping with repentance. Do the things that you need to do to work for the restoration of the relationship. Start doing the hard work of reconciliation. Jesus says that's more important than your ritual, than your worship, than your service, than your ministry. All of that is good, but don't do all of that if there is brokenness between you and your brothers and sisters. Reconcile first, then enter into these things. Now, the reality is, is it takes two people to reconcile, right? And so the tragic reality in our fallen world is that some relationships some situations will stay broken. That is unfortunately a reality that I have experienced. But you need to do what you can, right? As Paul says, as far as you are able, live at peace with all people. Do what you can do. Then come and serve and worship and fulfill when you've started to do what you can to make things right. Blomberg makes a very interesting observation. He says, how many of our churches would or should be temporarily emptied if these commands were taken seriously? It's an interesting observation and an interesting thought. And then Jesus says this, his last words in this section. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. This, this could be very straightforward, practical advice to settle out of court quickly with a brother or sister that you've wronged. But I think more likely what Jesus is doing with this illustration is he is driving home the point that the longer you wait to deal with brokenness in your relationships, especially if you are the offender, the weightier the consequences can become. 
The longer you wait to deal with brokenness, the weightier the consequences can become, the greater the brokenness can become. I've lived enough years, 38 wild and crazy years, to know that leaving stuff undealt with, it just leads to more pain and more hurt and more division. Jesus is saying, don't wait. Don't stall. Don't put it off. All of this relational brokenness in our world, in our churches, we weren't created to live this way. We weren't saved to live this way. Nothing is solved by perpetuating brokenness. Breaking because you've been broken or leaving brokenness undealt with so that it spreads like a cancer. We weren't made for this. We weren't saved for this. When I look at our, our culture right now, I have multiple concerns. <laughs> Can't go into all of them right now, but one of my concerns is, is that we have nothing left, it seems, to, to hold us all together. And we're seeing an increasing tribalism. And we're seeing an increasing fragmentation and polarization and we're demonizing each other and attacking each other and there's conflict all over the place and I'm concerned that, that our demands for justice are going to turn from, from realistic, good-hearted demands for justice to a self-avenging hate where we're just going to want to do to those who've wronged us what they've done to us. And I'm, I'm worried that we don't have morally courageous enough leaders to actually lead us through this. We don't have Martin Luther Kings. We don't have Nelson Mandela's. I'm worried for our culture. I'm worried for our society. I'm worried for the church because we're getting wrapped up in all of this. Jesus calls us to more. He says, don't kill each other in your hearts. Don't kill anybody in your heart, but especially those within the household of faith. Hear me, don't let anger and bitterness fester. Don't withhold forgiveness. Don't do unto others as they've done unto you. Don't avenge yourselves. Don't dehumanize. Don't falsely accuse to cut off community. If something is broken between you and another person, humble yourself and go to them. This is one of the most radical things we can do in our day and age. This is being salt and light. This is a deeper righteousness. As we take communion together today, you can Pull out your, your elements if you got them, if you, you need to get them. They're at the table, at the back. Communion is for those of us who have entrusted ourselves to Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. This is not for you if you're not a Christian, but if you've given your life to Jesus, this is for you. Even if you're not a member or part of Southeast, you're visiting, you're welcome to take communion with us as family. As we take communion together today, maybe you know that there are brothers and sisters here or elsewhere that you've been unrighteously angry towards. Maybe you know I've withheld forgiveness. I've hated them in my heart. I would ask you, before you take communion, to repent of that to forgive, to ask for the courage and the grace to forgive face to face. Maybe you know that there's a relationship you have with a brother or sister that is broken and you have made no strides to reconcile. You haven't owned your end. You've, you've left it undealt with. I want to say before you take communion, deal with these things. Don't let another day go by. Hear Jesus' words. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. It's important after a message like this, where are you at before you take communion today? What do you need to do 
before you take communion today. For those of us who feel like we can take communion today, what I want us to celebrate is that there's forgiveness and there's grace for all the ways we've messed up, for all the ways we've mistreated each other, abused each other, dehumanized each other, hurt each other, for all the ways we failed, Jesus died for all of it. There is forgiveness and grace and mercy and restorative compassion for all of it. And so let's celebrate that today, that our salvation is not up to us because what a mess, what a disaster that would be. Like, let's thank Jesus that because of him, there's forgiveness for everything we've done. And there's inexhaustible grace and there is help. Help to do better, to be better. And so maybe as we take communion today, we don't just need to celebrate, but we need to say, Jesus, help me to love my brothers and sisters and neighbors the way that you've called me to, the way that you want me to. Help me to stand out by my love. Let's take communion together. This bread symbolizes Jesus' body broken for us so that we could be reconciled to God and to each other. Let's take this in remembrance of him. And this juice symbolizes Jesus' blood shed for us so that we could be reconciled to God and to each other. Let's take this in remembrance of him. I'm going to give you a couple of moments to do whatever it is in your hearts you know you need to do, you feel you want to do. We've got some prayers up here that might lead you in what you want to do next. They're on the screen for those of you at home as well. And after a few moments of silent reflection, I'll invite Diana and Kirsten up to lead us in our last song.